Okay, so for Integral Dharma training this week, we're exploring the three bodies, and also might be referred to as the three states or the three levels. This is something that Ken Wilbur talks a lot about. Um, <clears throat> and in referencing these three bodies and three states and even three realms, uh, we can use a phrase like integral embodiment, that integral and in practice of integral embodiment would include these three bodies, these three states. And um, so one of the easiest ways is to answer why we would talk about this is um, one of my mentors, Hokai Sobel, I've shared this quote before, but uh, he once said to me, wherever there's an experience, there's a body. Uh, I think he shared that in a session with me or on Twitter, maybe, I can't remember. Um, but I really, that really struck me. That was really fascinating. Wherever there's an experience, there's a body. And I had already had exposure to Ken Wilber, so it wasn't like uh, I had reference points for that, but that really sat with me. Of course, it brings up, what do we mean by body? Of course, uh, that brings up that question. Um, so these three bodies, I already mentioned three bodies, states, and realms, okay? We'll talk about these three in, in those three ways, okay? So it's a little bit of a mix of those terms. Um, the three bodies, realms, and states are gross, subtle, and causal. We will talk a little bit about non-dual as well. Um, real quick, before we dive in, um, these bodies, these states are available to all of us immediately right now. They are not something that we produce or create you know, through causes and conditions. They're immediately available to us right now. Um, we go through these three states and we can go through them consciously as well. We can explore them and practice in them consciously. Each of these states uh, have essential characteristics to them that distinguish them uh, from the other, uh, the others. So that's important. Um, they each have a sense of their own deepening of going beyond, going within and beyond. Uh, it, and um, they also have their own limitations. Okay, so there's a deepening and there will be a limitation or even an attachment in, in each of these three. Okay. Last is a, is a quick introduction. These can also be seen as a stages of awakening. So Ken will talk about these in his books as, even though these are states available to us right now at any moment, our conscious experience of them unfolds in a stage-like manner on a path of awakening where we continue to deepen our awakening. So that's another way of looking at these. So I'm gonna give you a, a little bit more of a snapshot of each of these, talk about a relationship to the uh, four ups, the waking up, cleaning up, growing up and showing up, and then a little bit more detail. I'm kind of diving into this. We'll give you a little bit more detail on each of them. And um, yeah, we're, this, will, this will involve a lot of detail, but it's not quite as detailed, nowhere near as detailed as like someone like Ken would give in his books are like Religion of Tomorrow or Sex, Ecology, Spirituality. And it's, he goes into mammoth detail. My personal favorite is sex, ecology, spirituality. I find it's really inspiring and often poetic, even though he maintains precise language. Religion of tomorrow is a little bit more conceptual um, in nature, but if you want to have deeper reference points, that's where I would point you to. So um, I mentioned the words earlier, body, states, and realms. So body, uh, these are my kind of definitions uh, or, or yeah, as, the, my wording of these anyways. Um, so the body here, we're kind of referring to the totality of our experience, experience the, the kind of exterior border of our experience in a certain way. So it's this is kind of an interesting word as we explore these states and the gross body kind of makes sense. Like here's the physical body and there's a sense of like my body has a definition to it. Like here's my body and then out here is not my body. States refers to the direct experience of that level, the within of that experience. So with this physical body, there's also a gross level interior experience. Realms, I would say, is like the totality of phenomena and experience that happens within and, and outside of that body. Uh, and um, so I mentioned those three words because sometimes depending on how we talk about it, or if you read Ken talking about it, you know, one of these words might ring more true in that moment. So the so here goes the um, the next biggest snapshot 
uh, gross is the gross level, gross body, gross state is our physical body, thoughts, feelings, our senses, the stories we have, just generally what we experience in day-to-day life. This is called the waking state. We're awake. We're in the we're engaging the gross realm and the gross body and the gross state right now. That's happening right now. Um, in particular, there are objects of the senses. Okay, there are objects of uh, the six senses if we include mind. So that's part of this gross realm. And this is definitely the realm of form. Easy, definitely the realm of form. Subtle is deeper than the gross body. Okay, it's deeper than the gross state. Uh, we're letting go of our engrossment of the senses. So we're no longer really engaged in the objects of the six senses. Okay, we're going into something deeper than those. It's um, often our first taste of oneness, of the sacred, of the divine, of great other, of uh, radical interconnection. So there are a lot of words, especially the subtle so around there are just so many words and descriptors and expressions of it, but this is definitely where we get that taste of that something shifts palpably for us. Um, other words that come up in here, you know, we attune to life force. So like, you know, things like qigong and tai chi, there's a sense of attuning and becoming consciously aware of, of a life force that permeates us and all living beings. Um, we talk about the subtle energy system. And here we're talking in a sense of non-physical okay not a level deeper than than the gross body okay we have a sense of a subtle energetic system within us yeah other words that come up here chakras kundalini energy deity mysticism if you know the artist artist alex gray check out his paintings they are so many of them are just uh, exquisite representations of different of these different realms actually but especially his standout is the subtle uh, state subtle body representations here subtle so gross the gross state is about form subtle is sort of it's not form and it's not formless in that it's not form in the gross sense but it's not formless yet and uh, the state here is called the dream state so when we dream at night we are in the subtle realm so even if we're not consciously experiencing that that is the subtle realm then we have the causal and here, again, if you look at reading uh, Ken's work, he's going to use this word, the witness, in a lot of different ways. And he gets very particular about where the dividing lines are and where, where you place this. But for our purpose, this is fine. The causal is associated uh, with the witness of the totality of reality. Okay, this is uh, unchanging, unborn, um, formless. It's the witness of everything, the witness of everything that could possibly ever arise or that has not arisen and that has a, uh, arisen, okay? It's the ultimate witness. And here, this is associated with deep dreamless sleep. So there's a phase that we don't dream at night and uh, that can be consciously experienced. That's not what we have to do in order to experience the, ca <laughs> the, the causal state, but that's one way in which it happens. And I always like to reference this partly through the matrix, the movie, the matrix, when Neo goes into the kind of matrix simulator for the first time and it's all white, nothing's there, just a infinite expanse. And then they call up different forms, that infinite expanse of nothingness, but teeming with potential. That's that witnessing the causal there for me. Anyways, that's how I would, I like that metaphor there. Okay. So, um, I want to explore these a little bit more, but first I want to kind of pivot pivot back here and um, ask the question, so what? I like to ask that question a lot about everything that I'm passionate about. And like, I do that a lot, especially teaching. I was like, yeah, but so what? You know, this is interesting, but does it matter? You know, and usually I, I find a lot of times I find, yeah, okay, it matters, but it's helpful to ask that question. So um, when we talk about the four ups, waking up, cleaning up, growing up, showing up, it involves you know, embodying and integrating all of our full human experience and bringing our depth and breadth into life. So that alone would say, well, waking, uh, gross, subtle and causal states and experiences are part of the human experience. So yes, let's include all of it. Um, as I mentioned before, with respect to waking up, 
these uh, these three states and bodies can be seen as stages of awakening. So going from gross to subtle to causal and then non-dual, um, which is not listed here as these three states, but non-dual, this is a progression of deepening our awakening. Uh, cleaning up actually, uh, I would say happens in all three states and bodies. And interesting, I will say why I think that later, but gross is obvious so when we talk about trauma and emotional healing all the time in this day and age. So that's like nothing new. Um, the subtle uh, body and state can also reflect the traumas that we've experienced, you know, that it gets held and constricted in our bodies in the subtle body. Um, but also there's a, you know, thing called dark night of the soul, which very much that phrase, if you're familiar with it, um, or disillusionment that we might refer to in the phases of insight, often have to, I mean, really has to do with the subtle realm experience. And so we can say there's funkiness in all three of these states or things where we can, things can go awry so that where we can clean up. Um, and with the causal, um, you know, uh, there is a pain there I mean, that we can talk about of, of being born, which is, is like an experience of being, it's wondrous to, that there's life, but, um, it's the first split of subject and object in the experience. And we can say first, it's like, you know, we have to make some metaphysical assumptions here, but there is something that can feel this like disconnect. There's the ultimate witness of everything. Okay. And so even that can have a little bit of pain and some attachment. Um, growing up, this is uh, something that is an important point that Ken talks about a lot. We already talked about growing up. Um, so anybody, who's gonna watch this video later, reference my video, my talk on growing up. But growing up refers to the, the, the development of our consciousness and the structures which interpret reality. We're constantly interpreting everything we experience and expressing it via these hidden structures until we evolve and they become structures we know and can see, but then we have new structures that we can't see that's interpreting. And we can interpret every sing, all these states gross, subtle, and causal can be interpreted and expressed through the structures of mind, which means that they take different forms, different, uh, yeah, the different expressions. And, and with those different expressions can come of, um, can result a lot of different paths and different ways of, of talking about it uh, that often can be very conflicting actually. Um, but it's important to know that it's not one and the same, because that's the important thing is like, so, you know, we can have experience of subtle and we think, oh, the way that I'm expressing this and talking about it is equal to that direct experience of the subtle state. And it's not, it's the expression of that through the structure of mind that's experiencing it. Showing up, um, you know, we talk about how full or limited is our embodiment in the world. So, um, again, including all, all, all three of these states as conscious experiences means a more full embodiment. Um, we also might preference one of these states in the sp spiritual path of awakening. So for example, we can awaken to the subtle state and all of a sudden that's our jam and we're trying to relate to the whole world from a subtle state and maybe uh, shunning the gross state and the gross, uh, gross realm. It's a problem all of a sudden. And I wanna read a quote here from Ken um that's i clarified something for me here and how he he creates some of his developmental models but uh, i'm just going to read this thing explain it in a minute uh for in seeing that all sentient beings are expressions of oneself then all beings are treated as one's capital s self and that realization a profound fruition of the decentering thrust of evolution is the only source of true compassion a compassion that does not put self small self first which is egocentric or a particular society first, sociocentric, or humans first, anthropocentric, nor does it try to merely in thought to act as if we are all united, world-centric, but directly and immediately breathes the common air and beats the common blood of a heart and body that is one in all beings. This was really clarifying for me because sometimes he does put like these highest, highest levels, like cosmocentric, for example, um, and I was like, I don't know, because you can access these states in any moment. You don't have to be world centric to experience the subtle state. You can be at any level of development, experience the, the subtle state. And, and Ken says that as much. But here, 
it's like, yeah, we could grow up and be world centric in the way he's describing, but if we're world centric plus this direct experience of, of the interconnection between ourselves and all beings in life, then it's like world centric plus <laughs> or something like that. Um, yeah. So now let's go back into, now that we've kind of situated a little bit within the integral model we've been exploring, let's explore these uh, three states in just a little bit more detail. So in the gross realm of practice, at, at first, you know, we're not even, you know, where we can be aware of ourselves in a general sense. We can know that we have thoughts and, and our life path and that just all happens per usual, per normal. But uh, in practice, um, we first notice how easily thoughts and feelings can distract us, right? The stream of our experience feels overwhelming, like a cascade. Um, and um, we start to notice that and work with us, and we're starting to dislodge ourselves from this, this entanglement between our conscious lived experience and everything that's arising in the gross realm. Okay, and we're not trying to make enemies out of a gross experience, although that can happen at first. You know, this is very common that, oh, thoughts are the problems, sen sensations are the problems, um, feelings are a problem. Um, but really it's just our unconscious en engrossment, our unconscious entanglement with, with our gross little experience that keeps us limited and imprisoned in that realm and not having access to this deeper freedom that can be experienced in uh, these other states. And of course, I'll say this more than once, in the integral, an integral Dharma practitioner is going to be working with everything that's happening in the gross realm, okay? That's part of showing up, growing up, cleaning up. But in terms of this, these, this progression of states and awakening, that's what's happening there in practice. Now in the subtle, oh, uh, yeah, basically attachment here at gross level is pretty common. You hear that described over and over in the Buddhist tradition. It's, you know, attachment to the senses, attachments to thoughts, attachments to, you know, the cycle, the engine of suffering, of attachment, aversion, and uh, indifference. Now, subtle. Um, again, this is where we will go deeper in um, our experience beyond the senses, okay? We're not just uh, engaged with thoughts, okay? We're not just engaged with the sensations and, and sense objects. Um, the, our gross senses and faculties slow down and calm, and they can even, in our subjective experience, can even just turn off in a certain sense. We're absorbed inwardly in the subtle state that can happen. But there's definitely this, uh, this sense of these slowing down where it's not even, we're not even concerned with the, this flow of thoughts. It's not even a problem anymore. We're like, yeah, okay, great. You know, we can just let that be and absorb ourselves in this deeper state. So gross level distractions just don't hold the same power um, that they did before. Um, there's going to be a sense of letting go, a, a letting go into something, into being held in a deeper way of something that we can uh, fall into, trust. Um, and there's a sense of experiencing something transpersonal. And uh, I can make a point of this in sex ecology, spirituality, where the word impersonal might come up, but here that can indicate something like anti-personal, but here it's transpersonal includes ourselves, but we are identified with this thing that connects all of us. And the word that we might just use to describe this again is going to be affected by our traditions, the forms of practice and our own structures of mind. Um, and uh, one word that he uses a lot is soul they'll talk about the soul and he references a lot of Christian mysticism. And when he talks about the subtle state, whereas he'll shift and reference other traditions, depending on which state he's talking about, but often, you know, heart and soul. And, and um, these are the kind of words that come up. Um, there's a sense of moving beyond simply verbal descriptions or something uh, nonverbal, transverbal, intuitive at this level. There's a sense of going beyond ordinary time, okay, whether that's a slowing of time or uh, getting a taste of the timeless. Some other words that come up, uh, sense of communion, surrendering, becoming one with something that's inextricably part of a greater interconnected whole. Okay, we have a, we're going to have a sense of that. Um, 
and uh, Ken here, again, he uses the word soul, but this is a quote. He says, the soul is tied to no individual, no cult culture, no tradition, but rises fresh in every person beyond every person and grounds itself in a truth and glory that bows to nothing in the world of time and place in history. So here, these are all words that are just trying to point to this, you know, experience that we can have. And um, oh, I forgot to mention earlier, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, they have a similar model. Um, in uh, Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Dharmakaya. So Nirmanakaya is the gross uh, body. And often it's referring to the body of the Buddha, but it's, you know, our bodies, okay? We can, this is what we're inhabiting here and, and waking, waking up to. Sambhogakaya here is the subtle realm, and it can often be translated as transformation body, um, enjoyment body too. And uh, I, there's a great quote here that was from this section, and it says uh, in Sex, Ecology, Spirituality, precisely because they're no longer exclusively identified with the individual personality, and yet because they still preserve the personality, then through that personality flows the force and fire of the soul, of this subtle truth, the subtle reality that we share. Um, they may be soft-spoken and often remain in silence, but it is a thunderous silence that veritably drowns out the egos chattering loudly all around them. Or they may be uh, animated and very outgoing, but their dynamism, dynamism, that's it, <laughs> is magnetic and people are drawn somehow to the presence uh, fascinated. Make no mistake, these are strong characters, these souls, sometimes wildly exaggerated characters, sometimes world historical precisely because their personalities are plugged into a universal source that rumbles through their veins and rudely rattles those around them. So I, I like that quote simply because it points to the transformation. There's a sense of the, a person is transformed by tapping into this um, experience that seems to be universal, this, this directly available state and, and, and dimension of our experience. Um, of course, uh, there's the asterisk here to always circle back around to growing up because you can quickly veer off into labeling everything that a person does as crazy wisdom uh, when it, maybe it's just crazy, you know. Um, but <laughs> I, I think I agree. I agree that, that like there's a transformation that happens at this level, uh, but it's a, a spiritual transformation. Now, in terms of attachment here, I, this one is I see. I think this is probably like the most common one in the spiritual realm, in my opinion, but uh, it's getting attached to subtle uh, realm and subtle state experiences. Um, there's just sense like, this is it. And then there's just a constant effort to try to recreate, to try to get back into this experience and, and try to maintain it continually. And it's kind of painful. Um, it, there's a, so um, there's also the dark night of the soul, as I mentioned, that can happen in here, you know, that can cause quite a, a funk. And that's like after this is tasted um, and the experience can come and go, there's a sense of loss of like, I had it, but where did it go? And it's really painful because it feels so deep and so true. Um, and yet it's not stable yet. And so whatever happens in that, with that dark night of soul, we can, uh, I think, I don't know if it was Ken who called it the rolling up of the mat phase, or I can't remember who said that. We always tend to quote that Buddhist geeks, but I don't remember who originally said it. That was my experience, my first experience of a dark night. I was just, I just didn't practice for a while. I was just like, I don't know. I didn't even, it wasn't even that term. It was like uh, in the pragmatic Dharma community from Daniel Ingram, he started using that word. And then just that having a, a be, having a phrase for it, a reference point is helpful. It's like, oh, this happens and it's kind of normal. And actually it's part of your own progression. This is, it's a, it's a partly a good sign. Um, yeah, great. So now causal, uh, I want to uh, read a quote here from Ken. So in the causal, you feel that you are free from the suffocating constriction of mere objects, mere feelings, mere thoughts. They all come and go, but you are the vast, free, empty, open witness of them all, untouched by their torments and tortures. I use the torment and tortures, but really it's like in, in Buddhism, we talk about um, suffering of change. And that means like including happiness. It's like one moment we're happy, the next moment we're not happy, next moment we're bored. It's just the entire business of change 
becomes a bummer for us on a certain level. You know, it's painful. And so it's not just the torments and tortures. And in this witness, there's a sense of like not being bound. There's a part of us that's not bound by the, the ever-changing nature of, of our experiences on the gross or subtle realm. And we tap into, um, you know, in, in Judith Blackstone's practices, we talk about spaciousness or fundamental consciousness. We tap into this thing that feels ever present and out of that arises phenomena. So it's the, typically it feels like the background of experience, but in here we're, we're attuned and identified with this witness. For another quote here to explain this, with, the, with this discovery, you are halfway home. You have misidentified, uh, disidentified from any and all finite objects. You rest as infinite consciousness. You are free, open, empty, clear, radiant, released, liberated, exalted, drenched in a blissful emptiness that exists prior to space, prior to time, prior to tears and terror, prior to pain and mortality and suffering and death. You have found the great unborn, the vast abyss, the unqualifiable ground of all that is and all that was and all that ever shall be. That's from A Simple uh, Feeling of Being, which is a fantastic book. It's a compilation of Kin's spiritual writings that have more of this tone to it. So that's a good descriptor of, of causal. And here with in Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, Dharmakaya, which is also related to Dharma Dhatu. So here it's the body of reality realized directly in our own experience. Now the attachment here can be the attachment to the witness. So this is like complete trans, like complete transcendence, you know, complete spiritual bypassing to its max. You know, it's like I just gotta abide in the witness you know, safe from all the arising and passing of things. But again, it is a deepening of experience in, in a certain sense, but it can also be an attachment. Um, now I wanna mention non-dual here, which is not included in the three states because it's kind of something different in, in this model. Um, but he says right after this, uh, but why is that only halfway home, this causal? Because as you rest in the infinite ease of consciousness, spontaneously aware of all that is arising, there will soon enough come the great catastrophe of final freedom and fullness. The witness itself will disappear entirely. And instead of witnessing the sky, you are the sky. Instead of touching the earth, you are the earth. Instead of hearing the thunder, you are the thunder. You are the entire cosmos become one. Um, you can drink the Pacific ocean in a single gulp, hold Mount Everest in the palm of your hand, supernova swirl in your heart and the solar system replaces your head. I like his, po his poetic nature there. Um, but yeah, the, the main point is like, there's no longer witnessing that even that can relax. And this can be associated with this always already phase that we talk about in the waves of wakefulness. There's relax, like there's nothing to do. There's no, it's, it's okay. And all this is uh, infused with, uh, you know, he used the word spirit. I like spirit here, but you know, we use different terms in Buddhism, but we don't have to do anything. We don't have to limit ourselves by being a witness. Um, and uh, so in working with these three bodies and, and states, there's just so many practices associated with each level from all kinds of different traditions that you can find. Um, and, uh, you know, Ken, again, when you read his writings on this, he's going to be either very precise, kind of conceptual, really philosophical, or he's going to be really like intensely poetic like that. Uh, to kind of point this out, it's more pointing out. Um, when we practice like the realization process with Judith Blackstone, you know, her approach is non-dual. She starts there, you know, so, um, and it's a little bit more simple in the language, but we, it's helpful to still identify each of these in our experience consciously. I think it adds more resolution and more depth and breadth to our experience, even though we might like sort of not being aware that we've gone through these experiences, you know, let's do it consciously, which is what we're going to try to do today. I also think that even as a stage progression, we can cycle through these, right? We can have deeper and deeper and more and more full experiences of each of these states and each of these bodies um, and, and also bring them more deeply into the insights into, into our life. So that is the overview for the three bodies and three states.